Welcome back, and uh, one of the most important and amazing guests we have on the program regularly is Stan Dale. Every couple of months, uh, Stan, you've got a lot of uh, remarkable updates to give us. So what's the latest in terms of Earth changes, uh, solar galactic, uh, space weather, other things that are going on in terms of uh, people's preparedness, uh, the state of the nation, and the state, of course, of the weather and Earth changes that are going to affect crops and uh, habitable areas? Uh, what's happening? Um, well, a few things. Obviously, the um, there's going to be a, another asteroid or meteor pass close to the Earth, about 50,000 miles away, which is about a fifth the distance of the moon from the Earth. Mm. That that uh, asteroid is um, TC4, I think it is. Uh, how soon is that? That'll be the 12th of this month. It'll be Friday. Well, oh, well, really? That's interesting. Now, I know that there's one called 2012 DA-14. It's going to be 5,000 miles off the surface of the Earth, but they keep recalculating closer each time we get the data. They start yeah, releasing data. Yeah, 2026 originally, wasn't it? Something like that? Yeah, it was supposed to pass in 2013 on my birthday, February 15th, but they stopped reducing, allowing data three months ago because uh, they keep recalculating at a closer passage. There's also uh, data reports which are hard to verify about a Canadian astronomer that uh, posted up some information that uh, there's an asteroid that was going to, or, or a comet was supposed to strike Antarctica, although it's hard to get corroboration, saying that there was a report posted up there for two days. Right. And that was supposed to happen well, before. I don't know if that's true because I'm hard, it's hard to get corroboration, although we know this Canadian astronomer, astronaut, did give some warnings. Well, uh, you know, there are... There are a number of astronomers, or amateur astronomers, that are looking for everything from planet uh, X to, you know, near-Earth uh, asteroids, or near-Earth objects, more, more uh, correctly. I don't know that we're going to be able to hear much except by little leaks like that, and it doesn't surprise me that the information dries up as soon as it comes out. Yeah, that, and that one was posted, and I've actually seen video clips of a, a discussion by this astronaut uh, that was posted up uh, back a couple of years ago about nearest objects, and he's one of the top astronauts who are going back and forth to the, the U.S. space station. Um, so, you know, he's not a minor player, in other words. He, we're dealing with somebody who's talked about this issue, who has a specific concern and has advanced astronomy training as well and access to the, the kind of data that could generate this kind of report. So, well, in other words, it seems to pass the smell test, but it's hard to corroborate it. Yeah, um, I mean, biblical prophecy does say that we're going to have something hit the oceans of the earth and do quite a bit of damage during the time of the revelation of John, but uh, yeah. whether that's this object or another one, I don't know. Yeah, I, no, I don't know. You, you do a, you, you've got some remarkable research in a whole bunch of areas of plasma universe. We're going to have Professor McCanny on on Wednesday. But you've done a lot of work on the expanding earth, uh, right. the, 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 ge the literally the geology of the earth's structure, and the... Uh, and the kind of things that go on in space in terms of, you know, inter inter interloping planets or rogue planets, rogue stars like a, uh, a red or, or brown dwarf star that may be our, our companion for our sun, which is over 74% of all the stars have a trinary system. And I think there's a, something like 10 or 12% that are actually uh, trinary rather than binary systems. Um, these things are not unusual. They're actually kind of like standard operating procedure for our galaxy and probably most of the universe. Well, in um, McCanny's view of the universe, and mine as well, um, it, it does allow uh, quite happily for um, binary and triad systems. Um, it's like watching splashes or swirls uh, in, in a stream. Uh, you know, if you throw three rocks in, uh, sometimes they'll generate a, a swirl or a vortex, and you can see two or three of them, if they form, will kind of clump together by their, you know, the lowering the pressure between them by their spin, they will clump together. So it, it makes sense. Yeah, and the other thing is even galactic uh, groups of galaxies will even circulate and rotate in a sense around the center of their own mass of the different galaxies. So it's not something even just local space in terms of planets and stars. The same principles apply to curved space-time for even galaxies in deep space. Oh, absolutely. They, they call them galactic clusters for yeah. that reason. I mean, it, it's, you know, it, it's all in spin in a fluid of space, which I think... Modern astrophysicists are now calling, in, in concession to a degree, they're calling it dark matter, but that's yeah. like the old ether space that uh, James Kirk Maxwell uh, proposed in the 19th century. 
Yeah, he was amazing, wasn't he? Kirk uh, Maxwell's uh, transforms and methods of looking at uh, at space. I think, in some ways, mathematically, were more uh, advanced even than Einstein's. Well, I think Einstein changed a bit of what uh, Clerk Maxwell was trying to say in his mathematics. Right. And the reason that, that Einstein changed it was because the the test by the Michelson Morley group um, was trying to determine that there was a fluid space around the Earth and it would change the velocity of light. They they got zero results saying that the velocity of light, whether you shoot it out in the direction of orbit uh, of the Earth around the Sun or at right angles to the orbit, it always came back in phase and thus showing that there was no inertial um, or, or, or density change in the ether space as they were moving through it, or, or we are here on the Earth. But right. there, was a, mm-hmm. there was a basic flaw in that, and I put it in the book, The Cosmic Conspiracy. I, I showed what Einstein said, and then I showed what uh, he adopted from the Michael Morley experiment and where the error was. And it's a simple one, Bill. If yeah. you have a cup of tea you know, with milk in it, let's say, and some tea leaves floating around it, and you stir that cup of tea, it'll make a vortex in the center, and let's say the center of that vortex is like the sun. And there'll be some little tea leaves floating around in there because you didn't filter them all out, you know. And right. you watch those little tea leaves going around the center of the cup or the sun. It's like the Earth doing the same thing around our sun. Get real close, and you'll see that that leaf is being moved by the fluid. It is not moving through the fluid. That makes sense, doesn't it? Right. Okay, the Earth is in the same way in every planet. We are being moved by the spin of this invisible fluid of space, which creates stars and galaxies and planets and moons. So In other words, uh, the, flu- the fluid of space itself is actually pushing the Earth forward. Well, it's, or it's, pulling yeah, it, or it's, both. Pushing and pulling it along. Maybe. And so if you stick your hand off the Earth out, you know, 100,000 miles or so, and say, is there any, uh, you know, um, can I feel the stream of this stuff moving through me? No, because it is moving <clears> you at the same speed it is moving at that orbit from the sun. So there wouldn't be any differential motion, and that's where Einstein and James Clerk, or sorry, and, and uh, Mike, Mike and Morley, and Lorentz as well, where they all made the mistake of jumping on Clerk Maxwell's fluid space and altering their, his results or his predictions by what they thought they found in the Michael Morley experiment. And it was totally uh, inconclusive, and they never realized that until later in 1925 when Michelson and Gale did an experiment, and a Japanese guy did an experiment, and they found that they could make the density of space change on a spinning, you know, one meter diameter disk underneath a ship and that stuff. But the point right. is that Clerk Maxwell was right, and we do have a fluid of space, which is the thing that actually organizes matter into concentrations of, of atoms like planets and moons and stars and galaxies. You can see the pictures of the galaxies. I mean, they're spinning things like they're going into some invisible drain, aren't they? Yeah, in other words, basically what you're saying is there's a structure to space and space-time that actually organizes matter, galaxies, and stars. And they don't just appear out of the gas cloud. They're organized by actual structured space-time. Yeah, and, and that structured space-time, I mean, if, if, there, if there is, <coughs> if there are, like, sub-sub-sub-sub-atomic-type atoms in that fluid of space, or space-time, they are so small that there's nothing we've got right now that could measure their existence even. But yet the evidence by the motions of galaxies and galactic clusters and, and stars and, and planets, these all tell us that something, invisible something, is out there organizing things into specific radial orbits around centers, whether it be galaxies or stars. That's amazing, isn't it? In a sense, these are all, in a sense, non-plasma particles because most of the universe is a plasma universe where there's positive or negative charged particles or particles that have opposite spin, even the subatomic uh, particles. And these would be basically particles that, that don't have those properties. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, let's say you're talking about these subatomic particles they're mentioning. For a particle to exist, it has to have some mass, which in essence is a, a fluid spin or, of something around a center. Right. And they, they keep, if you go down as far as you can, like a million, million times smaller, we couldn't determine it. That was there. Exactly. Amazing. We'll continue this remarkable discussion. Uh, This is important with Stan Deo because you need to know because our world is changing. Welcome back and uh, Stan... You've been doing some remarkable research, Dan, on terms of the uh, 
the literally the spin axis of the Earth uh, in that research. We want to have you, if you can, come back next week to give us a little expansion on this because it's important to understand the science behind, you know, citizen scientists that are actually measuring some of these things to actually know that things are happening to the Earth. People notice weird climate changes. It's not just Macondo. It's not just earthquakes and volcanoes. The jet stream is changing. We're getting microbursts, all kinds of strange things happening. The change in the magnetosphere, 3 million square miles of the geomagnetic anomaly that's not at the surface level yet in the South Atlantic, if that moved right to ground level over Santiago, uh, Chile, or over uh, areas, let's say, uh, Rio de Janeiro, it would kill people because radiation would not be protected from interstellar space. And people really aren't aware that these Earth changes are happening at a pace that's pretty bizarre and shocking. Um, tell us about the spin axis data. What's going on? Well, we're been getting some amateur reports by email and by phone from people in Arizona and then up in Alaska saying that the sun was uh, not setting in the right place, but it was rising in the right place. Now, the only way I could figure that what they were seeing was true is if there was a um, an asymmetric wobble that periodically occurs in the Earth's axis. So, in other words, it didn't gradually change its spin axis now, but suddenly took a deviation over a few days where it, it went lopsided. But the, the the point of the southern point of the spin axis of that lopsidedness was such that you couldn't see the change in the sunset in the lower latitudes or for the equatorial regions. Now, to confirm this, I've been having these people check at sunset in their locations what the the altitude, like in degrees, of the sun is and what the bearing of it is uh, by compass. And since we're not using astrolabes or, or, or you know sextants and things like that. They're using compasses and eyesight as best they can, so they can be off one or two degrees, and we'd never know it. I check those results that they send in against the Stellarium plot for where things should be on that day and that time at that GPS location. So far, I've not been able to see a significant change in either the, the rise or the setting of the sun in these places, according to their reports. But these are current things that we're doing, and not you know from a month or two ago when we started getting the reports. Um, now, it is possible, as I say, as a, say, like a top that you spin on the floor. When it gets tired and starts to get ready to fall, fall over and, you know, and crash, it will be spinning but start to wobble a little bit, and it will deviate you know, in a sudden little jerky motion, and it will straighten back up again and spin okay, and then it will deviate again and spin straight again until it falls over. Well, in the case of Earth, it's not going to fall over, but it, if our orbit, uh, our physical spin around its spin axis, is about to change, it's tiring in its current position, it may uh, experience these little momentary uh, brief uh, deviations of its spin axis and then back. I'm talking in weeks, you know, maybe months, I don't know, but um, right. that's the only thing I can explain that with as far now, that as also, physical spin. Could that also uh, explain some of the things that I was told when I worked as a civilian doctor at U.S. Space Command where they said there have been previous times over millions of years where there's been a disjunction that moves very rapidly, not slowly over you know years and centuries, of the lithosphere and the mantle, where it literally moves along at a pace of miles per hour rather than uh, centimeters per year. And uh, we're talking about like the uh, the ambling of a very uh, senior citizen at 1.3 miles an hour <clears throat> over a period of maybe a month or two or longer, where the actual lithosphere is actually is crawled over it. Because one of the things they told me is they had these uh, space-based torsion field imaging technology back in the 50s and 60s where they discovered dormant magma domes and they're wondering how could the Earth be pockmarked there because they were looking well as an asteroid strike or a comet or and they'd say well no it's too deep in the Earth it doesn't have that confirmation they realized these are dormant magma domes where the hot spot had moved significantly and fr relatively rapidly from the point where it was previously so these were dormant from millions and millions of years ago so um, I'm suspicious that that there's got to be some kind of linkage where there's periods of rapid earth changes that are interspersed with relative quiet. Well, and that uh, this look, might be. I, I, I agree. Uh, the, there's an article published by NBC News, uh, the science section here today, uh, about the earth's outer layers may be spinning over a molten core. Well, if you look at the lithosphere versus the, the mantle, there's a, there's a drag between the lithosphere and the mantle and the deeper core elements. Now, when. The inner core is doing whatever it's doing, and the uh, outer mantle is doing whatever it's doing. There will be periodic adjustments of the torque as the two may drift apart. 
And we know from looking at the island chain of Hawaii and, and, and to the northwest of that, where there are submerged islands, that those were all formed by the mantle moving over a, a very hot spot in the core, which was trying to erupt and uh, through the mantle and make you know islands, which were submerged, of course, but not like Hawaii. Yeah, so exactly. This does, and this does uh, you know speak to that issue you're talking about that there is some sort of a normalization between the differential spins. Yeah. So, so in other words, it's uh, theoretically possible and it's plausible. In other words. Yeah. Yeah, it already explains geological facts that are sitting and staring right at us. What it means, though, is if we start to put things together, at the very minimum, we're heading into a mini ice age. We're having as a solar quiet period. We're having uh, experiencing a change in the magnetosphere of the Earth, which occurs periodically. The zebra stripes are discovered at the bottom of the ocean after the Second World War when they're looking for U-boats. They realize those zebra stripes were mid-oceanic. Uh, magma coming up and spreading out across the ocean floor, that there's a crawl of the ocean floor that dives underneath the continental shelves, and that these things are periodically, there's changes in the magnetic flux fields of the Earth, the magnetic pole. Um, and of course, some of them say it'll take a thousand to 1500 years for it to kind of flip, but it could be, maybe it's going to flip sooner. Maybe it doesn't have to go all the way down in terms of strength before it flips. And of course, during that flip, you could have a very major uh, problem with ground level radiation where like it says in the bible you could have all the grassy plants killed in one third of the trees something like an atmospheric change to our magnetosphere tied to a lithospheric disjunction appears to make sense of some of the scriptures in the bible doesn't it yeah and uh, and I might say that uh, there's been new developments on this ice age business you mentioned um, yep. the arctic polar ice cap is melting at an alarming rate Yet the Antarctic ice cap is building and is at a record high, since we've been keeping records. So why do you have one pole cooling rapidly and the other heating rapidly? This suggests a current flow. Direct currents will transfer heat that way. The other thing is a lot of volcanism. The Gakal Range, which people are unaware of, is about 1,500 kilometers long, is a volcanic island range that's as high as the Swiss Alps, and it's in the Arctic Circle. So these are all volcanic, literally, mountain ranges underneath the polar ice cap. So it's not surprising that some of these things may be actually occurring because of increased volcanism in the North Pole. Are we going to have an opening up here and let some of the, the heat energy out of the core, like uh, Admiral Byrd's legend uh, suggests? Something like that. I mean, I, there's a lot more to it. Didn't, he, didn't Admiral Byrd report that he saw vegetation and things that suggested well, in the deep north? Well, that's what reported. But, you know, they can't confirm that the, the diary notes uh, that people are quoting are correct. But my theory does say that planets will periodically open their polar regions uh, as holes appear there. And uh, it, I've seen this evidence on Mars, Titan, our moon, uh, and, and the supermassive black hole at the center of, the, of our galaxy, the Milky Way. Yeah. They all indicate that, but I don't understand why the South Pole is getting colder. That just that, that doesn't wash at the moment. Yeah, the only volca major volcano there is Mount Erebus in central uh, Antarctica. But there's a whole lot of volcanic uh, chains in, in, in the North Pole. Um, how does this tie with our current time period in terms of right now we've had crop failures of corn while well, Obama's pushing more corn for our gas hall, which is stupid. Yeah. We've got the green agenda, which is not facing the fact that the carbon-oxygen cycle is a healthy cycle that makes plants grow. Yes, you want to reduce hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide, which you can easily do with scrubbers. But we have economic policy that we let, yesterday we had on discussion, Professor Corsi, to prove that the, that the Nazis knew well about abiotic oil that was created by the nuclear reactor we call Earth that has a little thin crust, the lithosphere, and the blue line of air corrected by, and protected by a magnetosphere that allows life here, that uh, oil is created by the nuclear reactor called Earth. It's not created by dinosaurs and ferns. What do I think about that? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, and, and th this is important because the structure of the Earth is far different than the fairy tales have been taught in school and they, in the very nature. And, of course, they've suppressed science on purpose for public policy and control. Yes, yes. Is that our wind up there? I think it is. We're going to have to have you back on stand soon. I think we have more to discuss, so let's right. get you out of the next week or so. Uh, Earth changes are definitely ramping up, and I think they're going to preempt a lot of the so-called policies of our politicians and the plans, like John Robbie Burns said, the best laid plans of mice and men. Gain after glay in Gaelic, that means gone off to go astray, and our politicians are leading us astray. 
Thank you, Stan Dale. Amazing. And go to standale.com. Follow the blogs. Get the book uh, by Holly Dale, Dare to Prepare. Get yourself ready. Things are changing rapidly. 